So, all right, Karen. Good morning and welcome to our first program in the year 2022. Um, this is the Crestwood Historical Society. And, um, and I know you're not here to hear me talk, but I just before we begin the program that we're all here to hear, uh, I did want to introduce the, uh, the board that was uh, elected in uh, the November annual meeting. Um, our vice president, Conrad Youngren, could not be here with us today. Um, and then we have Jackie Leone, who is our treasurer. Good morning. Good morning. And Louise Glover, who is our secretary. Hi, everyone. And the uh, board of trustees is uh, Chris, Chris Fryer. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for coming. Susan Gleason. Susan, are you there? I thought you were there. There. And uh, Bill Carnes, who is coming to us from Massachusetts. Yes, good morning, everyone. Um, but um, like I said, this is not the reason you are here uh, to, to meet us. Uh, you are here to hear about the, the joy of birding. Um, and I want to introduce you to our speaker for today, who is Jack Rothman. Um, Jack is a native of New York City and, and a former science teacher and administrator for the New York City Department of Education. He also is a guide for New York City Audubon, and in 2007, he founded City Island Birds, which is a local birding club. Uh, since that time, his walks have become quite popular, and what I like about what he says about what he tries to do, he tries to focus on non-competitive, friendly, and inclusive approach to finding and enjoying birds um, in our local parks, and while he has gone to many other states and traveled to other countries, he realized that he enjoyed birding most on his home turf. And so he agreed to introduce us to the birds we may know and the birds that we may not know um, and what they look like and what they sound like. So even though we may not be a birder, uh, we may just be like myself, a bird watcher, um, there is something here for all of us to enjoy, and I can't tell you how much I'm looking forward to this. So I'm going to turn this over to Jack so that he can introduce us to the joy of birds. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, I want to do three things. I want to introduce you to some birds. I want to introduce you to the culture of birding. Uh, and I want to show you something about birders. So uh, I'm going to just get on to the first slide. In 1992, a friend of mine, his name was Steve, said, Jack, um, you want to go birding? And I said, um, I don't think so. He said, why not? I said, I don't know. I said, Bird, what do you do? You go into the woods, you look at birds. Is that fun? He said, yeah, it's a lot of fun. And I didn't want to go. Finally, he talked to me a few times and I said, okay, it's Saturday morning. I'm going to go over to Cranberry Lake. Cranberry Lake is in White Plains. I think everybody, everybody from Westchester might know where it, was, it is. And in Cranberry Lake, there was a guy named Ken who was part of the Westchester guides, I guess. He, he ran the place. And uh, we met there. And I think it was about 8.30 or 9 o'clock. And we started walking through the woods. There were maybe five other people. And he said, oh, look, there's, a, there's an oven bird. And that's the bird you see right there. And I put my binoculars on the bird and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Now, here I was, I was from the Bronx. What did I know from birds? I knew from pigeons, uh, house sparrows, um, maybe a starling here and there. I knew, I, I knew nothing about birds. And I was amazed to see this gorgeous bird walking around on the bottom of the, uh, in, in the leaf litter under a tree. It's called an oven bird because it, it makes a nest that looks like a Dutch oven. It's sort of a rounded, kind of a, a, a structure with a little hole on the top. And I guess it resembles a Dutch oven. And 
the names of birds is, is really interesting. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the names of birds because it's root, bird names are really pretty crazy. Uh, a lot of the times they don't make any sense. The second bird we saw was this flicker. And a flicker is, uh, many of you have probably seen a flicker, but being in the Bronx, I never saw a flicker. Uh, it's pretty amazing. Wow, this, is, this, bird, this bird is incredible. I couldn't believe how gorgeous it was. And when you see it in your binoculars and it's bright and it's clear and it's crisp, it looks spectacular. So that's, that's what got me to burning and I was hooked. After those first two birds, I kept coming back and coming back every week and birded with Ken and then eventually began burning on my own. And that's what brings us to uh, the show and how I got started. This is called a prothonotary warbler. And we're gonna be looking at a lot of warblers because it's the spring. It's the best time of the year to go birding. Uh, and in, by May 15th in, in the New York area, there will be these kinds of birds all over the place. There was about 34 different species of these in New York state of warblers. And there's about 500 species just in New York of uh, all other birds. And I'll take you through the seasons um, I'll take you through the seasons. Now, where can you go birding? There are birds everywhere. I mean, there are birds in the Arctic. There are birds in the desert. There are birds in the Bronx. <laughs> there are birds in Yonkers. There are even birds in New Jersey. I want to talk first a little bit about bird errs and the impression that people have about birders and the stereotype of birders. Uh, I think most of us, uh, some of us older people especially remember um, the Beverly Hillbillies. Uh, actually, they were, I was just looking this up before. They were actually on the Beverly Hillbillies um, 274 episodes and it, won, and it won a Grammy. And this was in 1962. And here you see the impressions of birders. Well, who, who were birders? Birders were, they were nerdy. Uh, the men were very meek. Uh, they were kind of like, um, why am I getting a text now? I'm sorry. Um, they were very meek. They were kind of, ner as I said, nerdy. Uh, they wore glasses. Uh, and compared to Max Bear here, Jethro, who was, you know, a man's man, uh, the women uh, were also kind of nerdy looking. Uh, they wore khaki pants and funny hats. Uh, that was the impression of birders. And I think most of us grew up with that. And what were they looking for? They weren't looking for an eagle. They weren't looking for a kestrel. They weren't looking um, for any kind of raptor. They were looking for a yellow-bellied sapsucker. I mean, a yellow-bellied sapsucker is a funny name for a bird. And it, it, it sort of, impl not implies, but you, when you think of a yellow-bellied belly, sapsucker, you think of something that's really, really frivolous, I guess. And it, 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 it even went over to the next, let me go to the next slide to the next slide. And we can see how else it works. Let's see if, we, let's see if I can make this a little longer. Everybody remembers the honeymooners, I hope. I'm saying live and breathe a yellow-bellied sapsucker. <laughs> Hi, Norton. Hey, Dad, what do you think, This is Bob, I'll be right with you. I gotta make an entry in my bird watching book here. I just seen a yellow bellied sapsucker. Bird seen. Yellow bellied sapsucker. Place where seen. Central Park. I'll tell you one thing that bothers me. They're not supposed to be within uh, 3,000 miles of here. Well, how do you know it's a yellow bellied sapsucker? <laughs> Don't forget, last week you saw a robin with a wishbone in its mouth. You said it was a chicken hawk. <laughs> I'm sure it's a yellow-bellied sapsucker. Why are you sure it's a yellow-bellied sapsucker? What else could it be? It's got a yellow belly and it was sucking sap. <laughs> I don't know why a man of your age watches birds. Why shouldn't I watch them? They watch me, don't they? <laughs> the only bird that watches you, know is a woodpecker. <laughs> okay, so there you have it. Let me see if I can get to the next slide. Um, it's the yellow belly sapsucker again. Let's, whoops, I'm sorry. Let me see, get this off. There we go. So I'm going to talk about birding in 2022. Um, if you look at my group here, 
Uh, this was a City Island Birds walk. This was bef really not 2022 because we did this walk um, before the pandemic. None of us were wearing masks and we had a, a hiatus during the pandemic. I didn't really have any walks. Um, we're still wearing the funny hat. Um, still have the khaki clothes. Um, so we're, maybe we're not that much different from uh, those nerdy people that were uh, in the Beverly Hillbillies. I'm not sure. Um, if you look at the bottom of my pants, you'll see my socks are over my, my nylon khaki pants, and that's to keep out ticks. Westchester does have a lot of ticks, as does the Bronx. So that's one of the things about bird watching you have to be careful of. And if you do anything outside, you have to be careful of ticks. So let's talk about birders for a little while. Um, a study was done in 2016, and that 2016 showed who, bir whoops, who birders were. I don't want to bore you with charts too much, but if you take a look at on the left side in table one, um, most birders were from 45 to 54 and from 55 plus. Although if you take a look, you'll see that there was some from 16 to 24, a little gap from 25 to 34, because I guess people are busy you know, raising families or whatever they're doing, working hard. Um, more birders participate. And if you go to the right, uh, you can see that in 2016, which was actually six years ago, birders made more, people who birded made a higher income than other people. And if you look to the very bottom, you'll see most of them, 26%, not most, 26% uh, were college graduates. That's not to say that other other people who are not college graduates don't uh, bird. Um, a few of my friends are not college graduates and they're great birders. But uh, in general, I think birders make more money uh, and uh, are more educated. That's in general. Let's go to the next slide. Whoops, I keep pushing the wrong, the wrong key over here. So here's a group of my friends. We went up to uh, Montezuma Wildlife Refuge in the end of August. Um, and if you take a look at the equipment we have, we spent a lot of money. Birders spend, uh, birders spend $41 billion in 2016. And I, I think that pretty much rivals golf and tennis. Birding has become really very mainstream. Uh, a lot of the equipment there we have binoculars that cost from two to three thousand dollars and scopes that long lens uh but we still have the funny hats um so bird has spent a lot of money and it, it's become uh, a part of the economy uh it is no longer fringe let me go on to the next one this was in the uh, new yorker um on the 21st so you're out in the field and you're looking through your binoculars and you see your friend over there and you say, let me try your binoculars for a second. And you go, wow, these are incredible. You know, I could, everything is brighter, everything is sharper. And the next thing you know, um, you're spending big money for a pair of binoculars. And then of course, there's that bird that's way out there and you can't see it, you need a scope. And then you want a picture, you want to take a picture of it. So you buy a camera and, um, that's what happens. It, it, it is a slippery scope, slope from a casual bird watcher to this guy that's standing over there. There are also birding festivals. People spend tons of money on birding festivals. Um, here's one that's coming up in May. I just turned to one page in, in one of my birding magazines uh, and you can see that uh, birding has is, 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 is gotten really popular. Let's switch gears now. So now that you have an idea of who birders are, they're just normal people. They aren't weirdos. Uh, although there are a few weirdos, uh, probably not any more than uh, in any other um, hobby. These are the most popular birds seen in um, at bird feeders in New York State. And uh, I was really, frankly, very surprised to see that number 12, the house sparrow, was all the way down there, uh, as well as uh, the European starling, as we know, those are invasive birds that uh, are not native to the United States that were brought here. Um, the, the house sparrow was brought here, I think around 1850, somewhere around there, to eat caterpillars um, that were in Brooklyn on some linden trees. 
I don't know why they didn't trust our birds. And, and the starling was brought here for a, Shakespeare, for, for a guy who was a, a Shakespeare nut, and he wanted to have every bird that was in Shakespeare uh, in New York. And the one that survived and proliferated is the European starling. And the starling, the bad thing about a starling is that it's a cavity nester, and it chases out a lot of our nesting birds, our, our cavity nesting birds, like the bluebird. That's why we don't have so many bluebirds around here. I think everybody recognizes the four birds on here. Um, anyone want to? I can't. I don't know if I could uh, find the place where we get the chat. Anybody uh, want to put in the chat what the what the top left bird is? Let's see if I can get to it. Anyone want want to? None of my birding friends. <laughs> <laughs> non birder want to try? Okay, the top left one. Chickadee, Nancy. Chickadee, there we go. Yep. Great. Chickadee, black cap chickadee. So the black cap chickadee is here. We, there are other chickadees. There's one called the boreal chickadee, which is up in northern Maine. There's a Carolina chickadee in New Jersey. So there are other chickadees. And of course, everybody's familiar over here with the cardinal, uh, the American robin, uh, and a tufted titmouse. These are normal um, and everyday feeder birds. You notice you don't see American robin here. And that's because ro American robins don't eat seed. You don't see an eastern, not an eastern, yeah, an eastern bluebird. You don't see that here either because they don't, they don't eat seed. They eat, they eat insects. So robins will sometimes be around feeders. I think what they're doing, birds are very social. They want to be around other birds. So they'll hang around the feeder because there's other social birds there. They'll also, I think, eat some of the worms from the rotting bird seed. Um, I'm going to play a couple of songs. Let's see if anybody can recognize these songs. We don't have that much time because I got a lot to say. Um, I'm going to play one. Let's see if anybody can um, can identify it. Uh, I'll, I'll pick one that's not too hard that you probably probably hearing now. Um, let's see if I could get it. They're in now for the migration. Um, and they've been seen all around New York area. Nobody's familiar with that one. We go down. Okay, that's a red winged blackbird. Red winged blackbird. I'll play another one. I'll play one more and then we'll <laughs> move on because we don't have that much time. So, learning. Learning bird song is pretty difficult for some people. I know for me, there's a fellow I know, uh, Tom Stevenson, when he travels and he goes to Costa Rica, maybe, he just learns them. He le he'll learn 50 bird songs. He just learns like five a day. I said, how do you do that? And he, he just has an ear for it. I can't do that. There is an app called Merlin, and I'll, I'll show it to you later, where you can let the, the app listen to the song and it tells you what, what, what the song is, what the bird is. Um, let me put on this one. Let's see if you can, this one. Uh, this is another pretty familiar one. I'm sure you've heard it. All right, let's try this. Okay, that's a song sparrow. So that's another fairly common bird. Um, I'm hoping that everybody is familiar with most of these birds. Growing up in the Bronx, as I told you, I, I, I really didn't see, was not familiar with any. The interesting thing about the blue jay on the top is that it's probably the most social bird there. So if I'm in the, in, in, when I go to Pelham Bay Park in the winter, I usually throw seed down because it, it makes it a lot easier to see the birds. It's now illegal to do that. So I do it anyway, I have to admit. And if a blue jay comes down, it immediately calls, and, and, and in three minutes, there's 25 blue jays there, and I don't see any of these other birds doing it. It's just amazing. Okay, let's go on. Okay, people ask me, should we be feeding birds? And you don't need to feed birds unless you like to feed birds. It's fun to feed birds, it's fun to see them. But 
you don't really need to. They've been, they've been uh, surviving without us feeding them. If you do feed them, uh, I would advise to, you to um, clean your bird feeder all the time because they, they, it spreads disease. I know I'm, I'm kind of neglectful of that. And you don't want seeds that have lots of cracked corn in them because that, you're just gonna get lots of pigeons. You go out and you see this beautiful bird feeder in the store, it's made out of wood, it's some craftsman made it and you hang it up and you come back the next day and it's ripped to shreds. So you have to buy a bird feeder that's kind of squirrel proof. Otherwise, you're gonna be spending lots of money for no reason, it's just gonna get destroyed. And of course, when you put out a bird feeder, you're making a feeding station for raptors. So once a raptor discovers your bird feeder, um, it's going to hang out and it's going to start eating the birds that you're feeding. Uh, so a good, a good idea uh, is to put your bird feeder somewhere under a tree. And if you do get raptors, you have to stop feeding for a while until the raptors go away. Uh, red, -tail, red tail hawks are pretty good for that. Uh, they love to eat all the birds from the feeders. We'll have questions later. I know you, some people may have questions about bird feeding. Um, and as I said before, some birds won't be there. Birds you may want to see, like bluebirds, are not going to come to your feeder. Okay, let me get to the next slide. So people say, what's the difference between birding and bird watching? Well, I don't know, is there, really, there, there really isn't much of a difference other than uh, birding is sort of a more modern term for one. And it sort of implies that you leave your area, um, you don't hang around your house to just look out the window and look at your feeder, but you go somewhere and you go birding. Most birders, when they go out, they, they hear the birds before they see them. And um, that's kind of the, in a sense, if you're going to be recording birds, if, you, if you're record, recording birds and keeping a list of the birds that you see or hear. So if you go bird watching, you really can't put down birds that you hear. If you're going birding, then you, you can put down, well, you know, I heard a, a black cat chickadee, I heard a Carolina wren, uh, I heard um, a, a robin, I can list those down in my bird watching list. I didn't see them, but I heard them and I know their calls. So it's really important to, to, if you want to be a really good bird or you really should learn the bird songs. Some of them are quite difficult to learn uh, because each bird might have six calls. And there are people who can actually hear one little chip note. That's something called morning flight in Cape May. And these people go up on a platform. And when the birds are migrating, the birds are flying overhead. And the birds make a little chip note as they fly overhead and they can identify the birds from that little chip note. Some birds can only be identified like this in Pedinax flycatcher called the willow flycatcher. So it has other ones. There are, there are alder fat flycatchers and other ones in its genus. And you can't, they all look at, the birds look all exactly alike. You can't tell the difference. The only way you can tell the difference is by hearing them sing. And that makes for a really interesting dilemma, which I will talk about later uh, when you're trying to identify birds. I mean, it's a kind of a funny story. After talk, you can't talk about birds without talking about bird migration. Um, this is the best time of the year. I think I said that already to see birds. Uh, in fact, it's an incredible time of the year. Um, it hasn't started yet. It's, well, it has started yet, but it's kind of slow. It's going to pick up as the weather warms and the insects come down and the birds follow the insects down. People want to know if you look if you look up why birds migrate, you have lots of different answers. Basically, it's basically it's to uh, find the best conditions for breeding, feeding, and raising their young. And so, in the winter, the birds go south, and obviously, in the summer when it gets warm, they come up north. And they're coming up here now from places south of here, mostly you know, South America, Central America. Um, some birds are long distance, uh, other birds are short distance migrants. They all migrate, they are all migrate at different times, but they migrate in groups and they wait for a, a day where, well, probably it's a hormone that, that, gets, that begins to generate in their body as the days get longer. 
uh, and they wait for an opportune day when the winds are the right way and they, and they migrate at night. Let me go to the next slide. There we go. So there are flyways where these birds migrate from. Uh, these are not carved in stone. Um, and you can see that the blue line is pretty much for uh, this. This only goes down, as you can see, uh, to Central America. But the birds do migrate further than that, as, as you'll see. So what happens when a bird that's in the Pacific flyway ends up in the Bronx, in, in Yonkers, in, in New York? That's called a vagrant species. And that happens a few times in the year. And it's pretty amazing. It's, it's great for birders. We love to see those kind of birds. But um, for um, birds, it's not so good. So we have a bird that could be over here um, somewhere, you know, or in New Mexico or somewhere in California, and it ends up over here. It's not supposed to be there. And how did it get there? Well, maybe there was a storm and it got blown. Maybe it, it made a wrong turn. And that, that's like a lot of fun. There are some incredible migrations. Uh, and you can see the distances that some of these birds migrate. 60,000 miles, 40,000 miles, 27,000 miles. There's only one bird that we see here that is a long, that's on this list, I shouldn't say, and that's the pectoral sandpiper. You can find that bird uh, here in the Bronx in Pelham Bay Park. You can find that bird in Jamaica Bay. You can find probably in Rye uh, and, and places in Westchester near the water. So this is a black pole warbler, and it's the, probably by weight, it's the longest distance flyer. Um, I took this picture of it um, right over the bridge on City Island, but you can see them in, in, in lots of the woods uh, in, in Westchester and certainly in Central Park. It's a, it's a warbler. It's one of the warblers. And of course it says black pole warbler, 1250 miles nonstop. Let's see if I can get to the next slide. Whoops, I didn't want to do that. Whoops, it went, there we go. Um, look at where it starts out. I mean, it starts out in Alaska and somehow when this incredible bird ends up in the Bronx or ends up in Yonkers or ends up, it's, an, it's amazing. When you think about that, it's this little tiny thing and I can take a picture of it and I can, I can look at it in my binoculars. Some birds don't migrate or some birds have mixed migration. So peregrine falcons, for instance, some of them will stay behind and some of them will migrate. Uh, this is one, a photograph I took of, of a peregrine taking a bath in a puddle at Orchard Beach. Um, you can go to Orchard Beach, and if you see lots of gulls, you know the peregrine falcon isn't around. The gulls are usually kind of loafing on the beach there. You know, they're, they're just hanging out on, in the parking lot. It's a huge parking lot, and there are puddles. If you don't see any gulls, you know that there's something is around, a merlin or a falcon. Uh, and, uh, there weren't any gulls there that day, and I looked around and, and, and saw this peregrine bathing in the water. Okay. So how do we know when is it going to be, a, I'm, I'm a birder, and uh, let's say I'm working, and I said, gee, I, I really would like to know when I could take a day off and, and go birding, because I want to go when, when the migration is good. Well, we have technology now. It's incredible. You can go online, and you can look at this map. It's radar. Uh, it's done by Cornell University. Uh, it's called BirdCast. And you can see what the next day is going to be like. It's not always 100% accurate, but it's fairly good. And you can see, well, where do I want a bird? I want a bird down. If, if, I, was living, if I was living in California, not so good. Um, but in some other states, it looks pretty good. I mean, look at the, look at the, the intensity over here. I think it's in the Carolinas and Alabama and some of these other um, places. I'm trying to get up to see where I am here. Okay, let's go on. So technology has really changed birding. When, when I began, you know, the only way, you, the only technology we had was phone calls. Hey, look what I saw, you wanna go see this? Now it's all changed. So some birds 
uh, as I said, some birds are short distance migrants, some are long distance migrants, and some just kind of hang out and they, they overwinter. So this is a, a redheaded woodpecker. Uh, that's probably a short distance migrant. Um, and I took this picture uh, also in, in Pelham Bay Park a few years ago. We had three of them. And all, this is a Southern bird pretty much, but it does come up North. We, we see them here every so often. It's a gorgeous bird. Lots of people like to see it. I know that a lot of people in Westchester have seen, seen pileated woodpeckers and, and they nest in Rockefeller State Park. And if you wanna go see one, um, if you do a good enough walk on what Rockefeller State Park a few times, you're probably gonna run into one. Um, we, we had a nest one year. Um, my wife, Jane and I were watching the nest. And some, some, some birds are residents. So this is a red-tailed hawk. I know you've all seen them. If you drive along the highway and you look up on the telephone poles, a lot of times they'll be uh, on the lights. You, you'll, you'll see them. They're, a lot of times they're just sitting there waiting for a roadkill. Um, and they are resident. And notice the red tail on the red-tailed hawk makes it easy to identify. The other thing that makes it easy to identify is right over here. You can't see it, but there's a band across its belly which, uh, which makes, makes it pretty good with a pair of binoculars. You can easily see that. Probably when you're looking at hawks in New York State, I would say most of them are gonna be red-tailed hawks because that is the one that is resonant here. You can go birding in every season. And so I just wanted to show you some of the birds you can see in New York uh, in all the seasons. This bird on the top left, uh, an Eastern Meadowlark. I took that photograph last year. Um, I took it in a rock, a Croton Point Park uh, on the right is a common yellow throat taken here. I think this bird on the left, uh, which is a pine siskin was, was, was taken also here and out in Long Island uh, in I'm trying to look at my notes. I can't remember the name of the park. Nickerson Park, Nickerson Beach which is out in Long Island, is where, where you can go over there and you can see all these nesting shorebirds um, and American oyster catcher. And you can see the little uh, chick that's next to it. It's really, it's really very cool to see. That's in the spring. This is, th these are, that's in the summer. So if we look, you can see that we've, I tried to represent each one of the seasons with one bird. It's pretty tough because there are hundreds of them. <laughs> Let's go on. So as I said before, spring is the most exciting season. And I just wanted to show you some of the birds that we see in the spring. So that's in these three, the first two photographs, the Eastern Towhee and the Cedar Waxwing. The, cedar, the Eastern Towhee was taken nearby. The Cedar Waxwing was taken in a traffic circle. I was driving by and I saw them on a traffic circle. I pulled over and took this photograph. You can see they like to eat berries, you know, small berries. And on the right is a, is a um, Cape May warbler uh, that was in Central Park. And we'll talk about Central Park in a little while. Central Park is, is, is a really special place. It's probably one of the best places in the United States to see birds. I know it's hard to believe. And it was hard for me to believe. Everybody wants to see warblers. They're really beautiful. And they're small. And most of them are yellow. This one was taken in Rockefeller State Park. You can go anywhere in any park in Westchester during migration and you're gonna see them. One day I was with my wife, uh, she had an appointment. I, while she was in the appointment, I just went down into the woods and I saw a whole bunch of warblers right there. I brought my binoculars with them. You can bird anywhere. Black Bernie and warbler, it's, everybody wants to see this bird because it's, it, it's just so bright and beautiful. Now these are, photographs so what you're looking at is something that's not moving but when they move rather quickly and they're they're searching for insects photographer always photographers are always looking for that bird rockefeller state park right near where everybody lives these birds nest blue wing warblers and as i said before some of the the names of birds don't really correlate with what they are i don't know if you would call that wing blue i, I would sort of call it gray but they know, you know, we have an American red start that's orange. 
you know, we have a hawk called a sharp shinned hawk. Well, I don't, I, I've never seen its shins. So names are really crazy. Uh, and that's a whole nother topic we can talk about on another time if we ever do it again. Parallel wobbler, very common. We see do dozens of these um, and we see them in the spring and the fall. Check, check its feet out. Look at those little yellow feet. Look how cool that is. Stepped out of the parking lot. And there it was, a scarlet tanager, right in the park, right, right above me in the parking lot. And I ha happened to have my camera and I took the photograph. Now, do you have to get up really early in the morning? Well, the morning is best. And the reason is birds start feeding in the morning. Once the insects start moving, then the birds start moving. The birds are just gonna go trying to eat the insects. Our New York state bird, the Eastern bluebird, um, they don't do, they haven't been doing well on their own. And we've been putting up blue, not we, I haven't, but lots of parks put up bluebird nests. And you can, if you definitely want to see Eastern bluebirds, you can just go to Rockefeller State Park and look in the bluebird boxes uh, and you can see them all over. And that's where I took this photograph. We have flycatchers here too, great crested flycatcher. They nest here in this area in Westchester and in the Bronx and probably north of here. Okay, I was talking about Central Park. What makes Central Park so unique? Well, think about it. You're migrating, you're coming down in that, mig that flyway. You've, you've been flying for, I don't know how many hours, it's the night and you want, the, the morning comes, the sun rises and you need a place to land. And all you look down, you're a bird and all you see is concrete. And so, you find this little patch of green in the middle of this big city. And you land in Central Park. Most of the Central Park birds begin landing somewhere around Strawberry Fields very early in the morning. And if I go to Central Park, we try and get there as early as possible. Uh, you go to Strawberry Fields and eventually you, you see the birds land in the trees as they migrate. And from there, they kind of spread out in the park. They Most of them ends up end up uh, in, in the ramble. And there are tons of birders in the ramble. If you go there during migration, especially on the weekend, there are birders all over the place. And it's not even like birding. You just walk up to somebody and they're looking at something. They're always glad to say, yeah, you know, up there, there's a catbird. That's the bird we're looking at over here. There's a catbird over there. And then you say, oh, wow, that's cool. And then you see another group of people looking at another bird. And you say, oh, that's a magnolia warbler. Wow, that's great. And you could, you could spend Mm, I don't know, from 7.30 in the morning till noon and, and see, you know, 16 species of warblers or more. And in addition to things like that Scarlet Tanager I just showed you and all these other songbirds. Somebody made a movie about it. It's, a, it, it's, it's dated. It was made 10 years ago. You can see it on YouTube, but it gives you an idea of what Central Park is like. I'm going to put it, play it for you. question people ask me is why birds? Female magnolia. Ooh, what burn is? It's almost like seeing a movie star on the sidewalk. They really exist. There they are. That's the flicker I was showing you. They'll see a little patch of green from way up there, and they'll funnel in. There's really no way to look cool. You've got your binoculars up. You're looking at something that nobody else is looking at, and everybody else is looking at you and thinking, you know, what a dweeb. Okay, that was uh, 
that, by the way, the guy that was speaking at the end was Jonathan Franzen, the author. Uh, and he was part of making this film. Um, and the, the fellow, Chris Cooper, uh, the African-American fellow, the black fellow that was there was the fellow that was, uh, had the big controversy. You must have seen it uh, a few months ago. It was more than a few months ago where uh, this, this lady had a dog off leash uh, and he asked her to put it on a leash and she said she was gonna call the police on him. I'm sure everybody's familiar with that. So let's go through, I'm, I see that I'm running out of time and I'm, I'm, I'm just probably about halfway through so let's just go through this quickly. Uh, there are birds in every season. And we, we, we went through this, the spring a little bit. I mean, there's no way I could show you all of the incredible stuff that's in the spring. And then comes the summer and it gets hot and you have, this, you have nesting species. You start looking for birds that are nesting. Um, in the left is a hummingbird that nested very close here, also in a traffic circle. If you look on the outside of that nest, that's lichen. And inside of the nest, the inside of the nest is made with um, the silk from spiders, um, from spider nests. That nest is about the size of a thimble, not much bigger than your thumb, and the eggs are teeny tiny. Um, to the right of that is a Baltimore Oreo nest, which is a hanging nest, which looks very fragile, but you know what? If you, if you come in the middle of the winter, you'll st still see them hanging. Here's a cavity nester called a hairy woodpecker and a bunch of um, barn swallows that were I, I saw under when I, I was visiting the New York Botanical Gardens in the Bronx and they, they were under by the children's garden one day. So after migrating, what do birds do? They breed and they nest. Um, and that's when they're most active and that's when they're singing and that's when it's best to see them. So this is a yellow warbler. It's probably the most common warbler around here. Maybe it's the most common warbler in the whole United States. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, you can see it's, it has a little bit of nesting material in there. I have no idea what that is. Okay, let's keep they're, going. They're loving it. Whoops. I don't, I don't know what this is doing now. Let's go back. Ah, it went all the way. It skipped. Okay, I'm going to leave this. It says I have this whole subtitle thing. Oh, I don't want that. I clicked it. My mistake. There we go. I apologize for this. Okay, and then in the fall, the birds all change. They lose their breeding colors. So this was a bright yellow bird. It was a goldfinch, which turns really bright yellow. And then in the fall, it loses its color. A lot of, we get a lot of first year birds or um, birds that have, they've hatched out and they haven't gotten their feathers. And it's very, haven't gotten their, their adult feathers. It's very difficult to identify them because they look totally different in the fall, especially the warblers. And it's kind of a challenge and it's fun and they're not singing. So you can't listen for them anymore. And it's also the most exciting time because we get, remember I showed you that bird, that, that flyway that was all the way on the West. And I said, what if a bird comes all the way East? We call those vagrant species. And that's what happens. Um, we get vagrant species coming over and I'm gonna show you something in a couple of minutes. This is a black-throated green warbler. You don't see a black throat on this bird because he's probably a hatch year bird. He just hatched out in the summer and he hasn't gotten his black throat yet. So it makes it more difficult. You have to use other means to identify the bird. Um, maybe the face pattern, sometimes the tail. It becomes a real challenge. Okay, I'm gonna to move to the next slide if I can. Where is, why is this not moving? Oh, well, I'm not ready for that. <laughs> okay, uh, sorry. Okay, vagrant species. This was the most fun. This is called a corn crake. This was crazy. It's a rarity in Europe. It winters in Congo and Tanzania and ended up in Long Island by Jones Beach. And um, we went out, I went out to see it. Now, I, I, I keep thinking about this guy. I mean, he was driving along and he saw this bird on the side of the road and he decided to stop and figure out what it was. I mean, I, I don't know if I would have done that. And he was a birder and he, he was just very curious. What bird could this be? And it turned out that it was this crazy bird that had no, no business being here. It got blown off course somehow. If it's seen in 
Europe, it's a, it's, it's a big deal. And to have it seen here was amazing. So when you go and you chase a bird, that's called twitching. You, so for instance, if I go and chase a bird, I said, oh, I went and twitched that bird. And you twitch a bird usually because you want to put it on your life list. That is the list of all the birds that you've seen. And it becomes very competitive for some people. Some people have lists. They have lists, state lists and um, county lists. They have lists in their borough. They have city lists. Um, and so they chase the bird or they twitch birds all the time. It's not me. This bird was in the median strip and we didn't know what to do. People were saying, well, you got to leave it alone. And other people said, let's catch it. And maybe we can somehow save it because it's going to get killed. And sure enough, it did get killed. It got run over the next day. It was kind of sad. This is an old picture. It's what people do when they twitch a bird. Crowds come out. So let's say a blue jay came over to the UK. I mean, there would be crowds like this looking for a blue jay. It's interesting that it's an old picture and it's all men. So if you go birding now on most of the bird walks that I do, I would say 60% uh, of the people are women who, who, who do the birding. So it's changed quite a bit from when this photograph was taken. Before I play this, this is an American woodcock that I went to see down in um, Bryant Park. Remember I said birds can be anywhere? Well, think of Bryant Park. It's on 42nd Street. It's a little tiny park. And I went to see this. It's got a great name. I wish they never changed the name. Timber Doodle, much better name than American Woodcock. Uh, I put some music to it because it's funny. Watch the way it walks. <laughs> fascinating bird at least i think it's fascinating watching it walk and, and doing that little dance that it does and if you try and figure out why it, well i try to figure out i did some research for the first thing i read was that it it does that because it's trying to disturb the soil for insects but that didn't make any sense somebody else i always thought it, it was a mating thing and it somebody did a, a project and it turned out that if nobody is watching the bird it doesn't do that it only does it when people are watching. And what this fellow says is that it does it because it wants its predators to know that it knows it's being watched. It also is a way that the bird can explode out if it needs to, if, if it needs to fly because it's already moving up and down and it only has to move down and, and explode out uh, to avoid a predator. And if you've ever startled this bird, and I have, uh, it does. It sort of explodes out. But it's a, it's a very amusing bird. I mean, I think it's great. Many years ago in Central Park, uh, we were, I was with my friends. We were uh, at the end of our burning day. It was probably around 12 o'clock. We had been burning all morning and I, we were ready for, for lunch. We had been seeing this bird on the left called the ruby crown kinglet. Uh, we had been, we probably saw 20 of them that day. And they're really kind of cute birds. We were ready for lunch and one of the guys who was a fairly new birder at the time, he's no longer a new birder, said, hey, what is this one? This one looks a little bit different. And we looked at it and we said, wow, that's not a kinglet. That's, that's a flycatcher. That, that's a yellow belly flycatcher. And if you take a look at it, you can see that, look at the way this bird is. If, if you, even if you couldn't identify it from its wing patterns and everything else, you can see the way it's sitting. 
that this one's the, the flycatcher on the right uh, is up. Well, I wasn't 100% sure it was, let me see if I could reduce this a second. I wasn't 100% sure that it was a, fly, a, a, a yellow bellied flycatcher. Um, we didn't have a photograph of, of it at the time, but that's what it looked like. And this was a photograph that was taken later on. So when I got home, I put it on the, what we call the list serve. Um, so people could come down and see it in Central Park. And somebody sent me an email not long after I got home. Jack, have you considered that this flycatcher could have been a vagrant flycatcher that's from California? And, and the reason was because it was November and this bird shouldn't be, shouldn't have been in Central Park in, in November. It should have been, it should have left probably by August. And so they sent out a, a bunch of birders got together in Central Park and they went looking for it. I mean, what motivates them is that they want to put it on their life list. And they didn't find it. The next day, another group went out and they did find it and they photographed it. And they decided there was lots of discussion on the listserv about different characteristics of the bird that it was a Western species. And, but they didn't know which species it was. Was it Was it a Pacific float, slope flycatcher? Um, or was it a Cordilleran flycatcher? Well, to me, it didn't matter. Uh, I didn't really care. Um, it wasn't singing. So how could you identify it? They look exactly alike. And you can see what it says up here, essentially identical to Pacific slope flycatcher. There was no way to tell. And guys were walking around with sound recording devices trying to hope it was gonna sing, but it wasn't gonna sing in November because it wasn't breeding. And somebody got the idea to wait around until it pooped. And they waited till it pooped on a leaf. They collected the leaf, they sent it to Cornell University and they figured out that it was a Pacific slope flycatcher from its DNA. And that is the extent that some people will go to identifying a bird. Okay, we'll finish with the fall. <laughs> we go into winter, owls, Pelham Bay Park, owls, long-eared owls. We haven't seen too many, so, so what owls we haven't seen too many, but we do see lots of barred owls, lots of beautiful ducks, and lots of beautiful sparrows. And I, I know everybody is very, uh, very used to seeing house sparrows, but there are very many beautiful sparrows, also called LBJs, little brown jobs, because they're so hard to identify. Also, the last few years, snowy owls, lots of snowy owls and um, being seen at Joan Be Jones Beach. Um, there was one in Pelham Bay Park uh, this year. Everybody loves to see snowy owls. They get badly harassed by photographers who come up very close to them, chase them, bait them, lots of discussion about that. And, and so we don't report owls in general when we see them on any of the listservs. So people have what's called, and I'm, I'm hurrying up now because I see that I'm just, I only have about six minutes to go and probably another hour of talking. Uh, life list, people have life list that it's kept on something called eBird. eBird is an incredible source. It's a cloud service. Um, it's from Cornell University. It doesn't cost anything. You can list all of your birds that you've seen, where you've seen, when you've seen them, and it keeps a record for you. For the birding community, um, all kinds of statistics are taken. So if let's say I wanted to go see a bald eagle in the Bronx, I could look on this list and see when was the last time when was one was seen or when, where was the last one seen or when was it seen in where or any bird for that matter. So it's a huge resource and it's free. There are smartphone apps. You don't have to carry around a book anymore. You can, you can carry around your phone, although I suggest having a book. And you can see that there's one from Audubon. This, the one in the middle over here is a Sibley. And this is what I talked about called Merlin, which is also a free app. Um, you can take a picture with your phone, although that doesn't usually work because birds are too far away. But you can take a picture of the picture you took with your, with your camera. You can use your, your um, phone to listen to the call. And it's pretty accurate, not all 100%. Um, so I, I mentioned eBird, there's Twitter, people Twitter each other. 
There's people have WhatsApp groups. There's rare bird alerts, and everybody's got cameras now, spending tons of money on on taking great photographs. So if you wanted to begin, what do you need? Well, you need a pair of binoculars. Um, I'm going through this quickly. As I said, uh, I would get an 8.42 pair of binoculars. Uh, I wouldn't buy them on my first time out. Uh, most leaders carry a few pairs or somebody would lend you a pair um, and a field guide. You don't need to spend $5,000. You can spend 120 bucks, something like that on a good pair of binoculars, 12 or 13 bucks on one of these guides and you're in business. And I always recommend going out with a group when you begin. Birding in Westchester. Wow, there's a lot of places to bird. Every park, every park is good. Um, I have a walk coming on Wednesday, uh, right here in Pelham Bay Park at uh, 8.30, if anybody wants to join me. Uh, I'm expecting a lot of people. I don't know how many birds will be there. It's, we're pretty early into the migration. Uh, Orchard Beach parking lot, 8.30. You can go on my website, City Island Birds, and uh, you can uh, get the specifics. You don't need to sign up. I also do walks in Van Cortland Park for Audubon, as well as my friend Joe McManus uh, and another fellow um, named Nadir, and we alternate. You can, you, that one you've got to sign up for if you go on the New York City Audubon website. Uh, New York Botanical Gardens with Debbie Becker. She's been doing it for 30 years. That's also a free walk on Sunday. It used to be Sundays at 11 o'clock and they let you into the park to go burning, you know, in, into the Botanical Garden to go burning. You don't have to pay. Central Park and during migration, Central Park is filled with birders. The Linnaean Society, um, they give free walks. The Museum of Natural History does charge, but I suggest the Linnaean Society. Um, since the pandemic, tons of people began birding. And so where we used to have 15 people on the Linnaean Society walk, I understand from some of my friends that there are now 100 people show up and they have to break up the groups. There's a fellow named Birding Bob who's been doing it for many years. He's, um, he's a very controversial figure to say the least. He charges 10 bucks, that's okay. But he uses a little speaker and he records bird sound. He uses recorded bird sounds and calls the bird, birds in. Um, a lot of people find it objectionable. A lot of birders hate it because uh, they come running in and hear his bird calls. And then it's him making the bird call and not the bird. Um, if it doesn't bother you and you go with him, you will see a ton of birds. I, I can only say, say that. Um, but there's a, a whole question of whether it's ethical or not ethical. Uh, and I'm not going to go into that. Sawmill River Audubon is here. Yonkers Audubon, which is now Hudson River Audubon, I'm a member of that. Uh, they, they do walks. You can go on their websites. Bronx River, Sound Shore does walks. Greenwich Audubon does walks. And if you want to bird in the city, Prospect Park is great with the Bur Brooklyn Birding Club and you have the Queens Birding Club. But if you go out with binoculars by yourself, you probably will see some birds, but you'll see a lot more if you go out with a good leader. And I think I'm just about done. I have a little video, but it's five minutes. I don't know, do I have five minutes? I don't really have five minutes. So I'll see at the end, we, we'll we skip this, this talk. We, I can go back to it in case people want to see it. it it's where I, I take a group out burning and what it's like, but I guess we ran out of time. So my, my first walk in 2007 was with City Island Birds. Uh, those are the people and the, and the person who took the photograph. Um, and now uh, it's really grown. I guess birding has grown. And we have these huge walks. Whoops, let me go back. We have these huge groups. This is a, a group. And we're trying to get more younger birders. We're trying to get uh, more diversity in our birding. Um, and I think we're, su we're succeeding little by little. Uh, everybody's always been welcome. There's never any fee. And uh, I'm always happy to see more people. Sometimes what we have to do is break up into groups. I have a couple of friends or more than a couple who are really excellent birders. And we just kind of break up into groups and we call each other on the phone to see what everybody's seeing so we don't miss any birds. And I'm gonna thank everybody for um, watching my slideshow. Um, these are just some photographs of some of the times we went birding. Um, this was a winter birding on the, on the left on the bottom. Uh, that looks like spring. Um, 
and some of my my friends. And the lower left, I think we were watching a, a great horned owl. Um, and I'm on the top left, we were we were looking at birds in the puddle. We had all these shore birds in the puddle. So I don't know. Um, I'm going to stop sharing, and maybe people have questions. Is there a best way to see warblers in the sense that, like, some birds are on the ground, some are in the trees, but maybe up high or in low? Right. I, I was looking last year for warblers, and I had the hardest time finding anything. Right. So some warblers, like the different warblers, take different positions in the canopy. So, for instance, if you took a... a uh, a worm-eating warbler, worm-eating warblers, or that little oven bird, they stay down low. They're usually crawling, they're, they're usually on the ground. Um, whereas other birds will stay in the middle and other birds will be way up high. So a good place to be is not in a park that has really, really, really high trees, because then you're going to get what's called warbler neck. <laughs> and that's when you're taking your binoculars and going like yeah. that, and your neck hurts like anything. And so uh, Prospect Park has great warblers. But if you go in a lot of places in the park, the trees are really high. And so what you're really seeing is the little yellow speck. You see the warbler from underneath, and it's really hard to identify them. Of course, um, there are books, um, warbler books, which show, the, show what the birds look like from underneath. But you want to see them at eye level. So I, I think Central Park is pretty good to see birds. That are, the trees are not that high. Uh, and you can get pretty much the whole, you know, the, the birds that are up high, the birds in the middle, and the birds that are down low. Um, one of the things that is not really considered ethical is calling birds in using bird calls. But what will happen is a bird that's really up high will come down low to hear what that call is. And um, you'll get a better look at it. Excuse me, Jack. Z said Thank we you. can ask if you have time to show the video. I can, I have plenty of time. I, I, I know that this, I was supposed to, I had an hour. So I have a, I have a question. Do you, are you familiar with the Israeli birder Yossi Leshem uh, did work on uh, finding the migration patterns uh, to help the Air Force, the Israeli Air Force avoid the uh, clashing into birds? Yeah. I don't know if the Air Force, I don't know anything about what the Air Force does. I know that if they if, gave him money to do the research. Oh, ah, that's great. Yeah. No, New Rochelle, I, I look at migration and I look at New, I think of New Rochelle. New Rochelle, we drive through there all the time because we live nearby. They have built probably a dozen high rise buildings and they're all glass. I mean, there's going to be devastating when the migration comes. These birds are going to be smashing into the glass. They find it in Manhattan, they find birds all on the ground, all these warblers on the ground, either stunned or dead. Uh, crashing into the glass buildings. Do you want to? The, the, uh, I, I just I want to say, Jack. Um, unless there are other questions, uh, I'm I am fine with you showing the five minute video. Uh, I think if people don't want to stay, they can they can leave. But okay. I just want to make sure that you know if there are any other questions that people are aren't going to be able to stay for the video and would like mm -hmm. to ask. Let's give them that. I have a question. Sure. I have a question. Well, I, I would like to ask, what was that intro level but pair of binoculars you recommended, Jack? Oh, I have a few different pairs. Um, if you email me, I will give you a little rundown. But I, the ones okay. that I think are really terrific for the money, there's, there's one called a Nikon Pro Staff. And they're about 120 bucks. I think I may have seen them on sale at B&H for $99. And there's another one called a Celestron Nature. <laughs> I think they're also, and I would recommend eight by 42. If you have those little tiny binoculars, um, and you're, convert, you're gonna be really frustrated. Yeah. The, 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 the view is very narrow like that. And so the bird is over here. You're, you're, you're gonna be trying to find the bird. It's really hard. So you want you want wide. So that's yeah. why eight by 42. Eight by 42? Eight by 42 is what I recommend. If you have really, really, Hands that are really, really steady. You can probably do a 10 by 42, but for those of us who are over 50, especially, I recommend uh, 8 by 42. Uh, your hands are not steady. You think they're steady, but you're holding it up and, and, and you're going like this and the bird is you know, vibrating. Hi, <laughs> Jack. Jack, this you is didn't Michael. You mentioned finches. Hi, Michael. Hiya. 
I, I have a, a maybe strange question. I'll give you a shot at it. Uh, in terms of birds' comfort and attraction or aversion to people, if, if you look at the kind of the end of the spectrum of that, in terms of birds that really love and get attracted to people, not just for feeding, but just to be around people, although maybe it's that's hard to discern the difference, uh, or those that really, you know, are antagonistic or you know, they really show that they don't like people around. Do you have any? Well, I think most partners, yeah, you know, they don't know if we're a predator or not. Some birds, when they're young, for instance, red-tailed hawks, young red-tailed hawks, when you can get really close to them, they just don't seem to be afraid of you. Eventually they learn, you know, <laughs> don't get near, near people. But in the beginning, there was one down at, nearby here in, in a place called Turtle Cove. And we thought there was something wrong with it because it, it wasn't flying away from us. We were within six feet of it and it just stayed there. And we said, there's something wrong with it. So I got in my car and I got a cardboard box and I came home and I bought a pair. Of, I got a pair of gloves and we were going to put it in a box and bring it down. And my friends were down there. They were watching the bird. Um, and I came down and they spent maybe a half hour getting, you know, driving back and coming back. And then when we got there, the bird just flew up into a tree. It was fine. It just not scared. It wasn't scared. It just, just not scared of people. Other birds, when we go to, for instance, we go to Sanibel Island a lot. And, and for First a couple of weeks, Sanibel Island's in Florida. And the okay. shorebirds there are not afraid of people. You can come within six or eight people of the shorebirds. They just walk alongside you. Mm -hmm. uh, it's amazing. So really? yeah. I think it has to do with, you know, their perception of what the people want to do and, uh, mm -hmm. and how habituated they get. Um, and I will. Thank you.